So hello everyone and thank you for joining us for another Emacs chat episode. Today we have Mickey Peterson of the wonderful Mastering Emacs blog. Hi! <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, well, I've been reading uh, Mickey's blog for, for ages and ages now, and, uh, and, and it's always interesting to see how people are learning about Emacs, how people are digging into the advanced features uh, and becoming better at using Emacs. But also, it's really cool to just meet other people who use Emacs in the first place. So, before we dig into all things Emacs related, You've met, uh, you know, uh, what else are you interested in? Uh, your webcam, well, actually, your camera image right now is super fancy and professional, but it's like <laughs> that's the feel thing going on here. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, basically, you know, I, uh, I hooked up my uh, DSLR camera because I don't actually have a webcam. So, it's rather that on my phone. And I, uh, yeah, the phone holding that for an hour, it's, it's, it's just not very good, is it? So, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, so photography is one of your interests. So what yeah. are the other things that you're into outside of Emacs? Uh, well, I mean, I love cooking. That would be my other main hobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I take it quite seriously as well. Uh, so the sous vide cooking and all this fancy stuff. Um, so yeah, I really like cooking, uh, cooking photography, and obviously computers. You know, I'm a professional software developer by day. Um, the arts, generally, um, I mean, I live in London, so there's plenty of things to do and see. So yeah. Yes, plenty of things to do and see, and, and even a, an Emacs meetup to go to, for which we are um, very envious. Uh, and, and cooking, I, I remember seeing some of those org mode mailing list discussions about using Emacs and cooking to get, you know, to have really? to cook. Yeah, 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 no, seriously. Um, because it, it's easy, of course, to store recipes in there, and if you have your recipes and tables, then you can do some fancy things with units of measurement and combining ingredients from multiple recipes and so forth. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm into cooking as well, but not clearly not as geeky as you are in terms of oh, the Well, you know how it is. The, the great thing about cooking is that you don't need a whole lot to get started. You just need some good ingredients, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and speaking of getting started in ingredients, how did you get into Emacs in the first place? I, mean, I saw the story briefly on your blog about being told by someone that Vim is the one true editor and therefore being stubborn about yeah, it and going uh, off. So, Tell me so, the story. <laughs> so basically, well, I mean, I think like a lot of people, you sort of, you expand your mind a little bit when you go to university. So I studied computer science, so the lecturers there were obviously in two camps, or in the Vim or the Emacs camp, and Everyone's like, you need to use Emacs, you need to use Vim. And at that point, I hadn't really made up my mind yet. So I was hanging out in a local computer society, you know, where there's no shortage of opinions. Uh, <laughs> and everyone was like, you know, you have to use Vim. And if you're not Vim, you're not cool. You know, for certain definitions of cool anyway. Uh, so um, obviously, being the contrarian that I am, I immediately decided to pick Emacs instead. So it was actually quite fortuitous that I sort of ended up at that point in time in that, uh, in that computer lab. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, to use Emacs, I don't think. So yeah, so I picked it up. And well, I actually started out with X Emacs, not new Emacs. Because back then, you know, it was still a bit more about con contention as to which one was the better one. But I quickly realized that new Emacs was the best one. So starting in Emacs 22 or 21.7 or something, I started uh, on new Emacs. And I've pretty much remained on that ever since. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, there aren't that many people who used Emacs back then, and I suppose because it has a fairly, you know, big learning curve, but I guess we'll be talking about that in a moment as well. Right. So, yeah, it was completely by happenstance that I ended up using Emacs. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, kind of climbing that learning curve on your own? Were there at least a few other people? Ah, so actually, I'm entirely self taught with <gasps> Emacs. I never had anyone to teach me Emacs aside from what I could sort of find on the internet. But even, I mean, Emacs, the community, has changed a lot, even in five years. And back when I started, which is about 2003, there's a lot fewer materials out there. So it's really just a matter of sort of scraping together bits and pieces here and there. The Emacs Wiki was around, I think, and just sort of playing around with it. But there was, you know, it was a steep learning curve. And I feel there was a long period where it didn't really improve a lot. You know, you were just sort of using the arrow keys, you know, sort of trying to remember the most basic of settings, you know, using the menu bar and all that to get around. And yeah, so, um, yeah. So it was really just the sheer contrarian force of will that uh, got yeah. you there for the first couple of years by yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People who know me would, would definitely say, yeah, that's Mickey. <laughs> So you mentioned the Emacs Wiki. Were there any other resources that you found really helpful when you were getting started? Hmm. You know, 
No, I don't, yeah, not one. Uh, news groups, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the IFC channel as well was, was fairly helpful back then. Um, but I, I didn't really know what to ask for. You know, the thing about Emacs is just, you know, you need to know what you're looking for, you know? So when you don't know what the editor can really do, it's hard to go out there and say, well, I want to learn how to do this. So I primarily used it for Python. So learning Python, I did as well. And, you know, you start adding things to it. I started out with outline mode, actually. Then someone told me about work mode. And, you know, you're an expert in work mode. So, so you know what it's like. You know, you go, ooh, this is a lot better than outline mode. And, you know, then you start doing your timetables in it. And you start estimating your projects in it. And, you know, it pretty goes by crazy from then on. But, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so you're using it for real work, like Python and project management and other things, and uh, and and it, those are the kinds of things, I guess, that that made you curious about what else you could do with it, or help you stumble across ideas or, or features that you could you could implement. Um, I, I hear you when you talk about how difficult it is to find things when you don't even know what you're looking for. And yeah. that's one of the things that I really appreciate your blog for. Mastering Emacs is this great source of, of blog posts that, that make you go, I had no idea that, uh, well, I, I, I thought, of course, Emacs could probably do something like that, but I had no idea how useful it is that it could do something like that. And you do a great job of explaining things. Oh, thank you. So, you, so, so if, you're, if you're teaching yourself all of these things, and news groups tend to be focused more on, you know, um, helping people ask questions and answering maybe the occasional um, or sharing the occasional like weird idea or hey look yeah. at this so cool I made it. Um, it, it. Like how else are you? In how else are you finding out more about the interesting things you can do in Emacs? Yeah, so it, I think everyone has this sort of you know linchpin moment where you sort of go now I get Emacs, you know, maybe not all of it, you know, because, you know, it's a big, big editor, but you sort of reach a point where, you know, you, you know how to get more information. You don't, not necessarily by, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Sasha, you must have gotten to the point now where you're like, well, here's a new mode. I kind of know how to install it. Okay, it's made easier with package managers. That's but, so awesome. Yeah, so, you know, I know how to install it. You know, let me play around. I know where to look for the help in yeah. it. And I know how to list the key bindings, use find function and all that stuff to sort of to help me find out more about things. And I got to a point where I was sort of pretty proficient in it. And I said to myself, well, I want to keep learning more. So every time I thought... I was doing something quite inefficient, I would go out of my way to try and solve that problem in a more Emacsy way, mm -hmm. which obviously means you get to try all kinds of crazy things that you can drag into Emacs, you know, email being a good one, uh, and you know, that's a multi-year project that uh, I think a lot of people end up abandoning in the end, but um, yeah, so you just start adding and adding and adding, and it was about, let's see, well, was in 2011, I think, it was a few years before that. I just started having an org mode file where I sort of keep track of what I call blog ideas or things I would tell other people about. And I just started adding, you know, thing after thing after thing after thing to this thing. And the list just keeps growing. And um, then I had a job where I met a DBA chap, Lee, and he was trying to learn Emacs having moved there from Vim. But his needs were very different from mine, being primarily sort of a system administrator DBA. So he was like, oh, the, you know, MX Shell, that looks really cool. You know, how do you start using that? And, and he sort of encouraged me to start writing about it, actually. So that's actually where the blog comes from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, just, yeah, just starting to learn more by investigating and exploring. The info manual is actually a great place. Yeah. Just pick a random topic, read up about it. It's not going to be enough, but you start playing around with it, and eventually, you know, the knowledge accrues, right? Yes, it's good bedtime reading. And it, and you <laughs> learn something every time you go through it. Maybe it's also because the pe people keep adding things. And then when, once you're done with the info manual, you can read the, you know, you can read the, the help files for various, uh, the other info manuals for other packages. You can yeah. then you end up reading the source code, and you laugh about the interesting functions <laughs> people have written. And then you're like, oh, if I take this and this, and I smush it together, I get something yeah. completely new. But well, I think that's the big problem as well with the info manual. It does a great job sort of giving you basic exposition, saying, well, here's what this is supposed to do. But it doesn't tell you how you use it, you know, in, in the real world, how you map all these different things together. You know, so that's where what I call workflow, basically, where you learn to combine tools and techniques to basically 
do things like learning to use orc mode, you know, in a professional manner for, you know, be it time tracking or whatever, or using Dira to better handle files, you know, just little things that really add up to a lot of value. Mm. I think that's an important point because it's the workflows that really distinguish advanced use with Emacs. You have all these components which are, you know, they're, they're great to know about. It, but it's, it's really seeing how other people put it together or being able to, to look at those components and imagine how you put them together in, in your own workflow that makes a difference. Now you mentioned, you know, getting to that Lynchman moment, that point where it suddenly gelled and the, you know, the light showed and the angels descended from the heavens and said, this is, you know, what Emax is all about. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and part of that was because you, you figured out how to find your way around the documentation. Were there any other aha moments that, or, or things that helped you figure out, you know, get to that level of understanding the workflows and, and the possibilities? Uh, let's see. Well, I mean, being able to do a modicum of ELISP, you don't have to be an expert. You don't even have to be able to write your own modes or anything like that, but just understanding the basic syntax. And for most people, I think, you know, the gateway drug, if you like, is adding key bindings, you know? And then this little snip is just set settings in a mode hook. You know, that's, you know, that's how it starts. And then you go, well, especially if you're already a programmer, admittedly, it would probably be a lot harder if you're not. But then you start looking at the source code because, you know, you learn that you can just click around in the, uh, in the help thing to, to sort of jump around. And then you start reading the code and you go, oh, well, I can tweak this a little bit, you know. And, well, you know, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, isn't it? You know, <laughs> if you can call it that, where you get to a point where you've sort of accrued enough knowledge that you feel reasonably comfortable navigating. But, you know, there's still things that I don't fully understand very well. I mean, Orc mode is very complex. You know, there's lots of workflows that you can really learn. I never really mastered email either, I have to admit. <laughs> and set a, am I even pronouncing that right? C E D T. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is an Emacs now in some form, uh, which is hyper advanced, you know. Uh, but I could never really crack that nut. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 10 years and you still feel like a newbie sometimes. And you're oh, yeah, at... absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What was it? So, so give me some specifics. Tell me the story of your first couple of customizations. What got you to fall in love with it? Ah, uh, what was it? I suppose it was, you know, the fact that it does everything. You know, it, you know, it may not be the best at everything, but it can do everything. And things like shell mode integration was very useful. Um, even things like being able to sort of shell out to, to, to grab and have it, you know, um, hyperlink all the matches would be a good example. Uh, but it's mostly the little things. It's not even the programming modes themselves because lots of editors do that. But few editors let you shell out to something, get the result back and have it fed through Emacs or regular expressions that you can combine with S expressions to create, you know, strange side effect written replacements to do all kinds of crazy things, but yeah, it's, it's all the little things, I think. Um, but shell mode is probably the big one for me because I use it all the time. Okay, uh, and on that note, uh, because it's it's so interesting to see people's workflows in action. Would oh, you mind, I mean, you can think about this too, because we might not have prepared this segment, but um, but would you mind, say, walking through your configuration or, or how you use things and really show things off to people who are like, well, Okay, Emacs sounds cool, but what can you really do with it? You know, show off of it. <laughs> oh, now we can put on the spot. Or yeah. you could also just say, hey, you know what? It, it, this is really cool. This is how I've set it up for me. Well, I mean, I can sort of share some of the things that I really like about it, perhaps. Let me just click a yeah. few buttons to get the desktop up here. Let's see. There we go. Awesome. Right. So I'm not sure that's coming through. Yeah, okay. I see it. Let's see if we can maximize. There we go. Oh, that's not really that's, rendering. Yeah, right. that did funny things. Yeah, I was trying to maximize it. That was being a little bit too clever here. So, <laughs> no, it's fine the way it is. Right. Well, I mean, so let's see. So, I like shell mode um, because you can edit it. It's just a text buffer. A lot of people like eShell, which is also nice. Oh, let's see, you don't actually get... Your, uh, um, yeah, there you go. There we go. So we also have eShell, which is Emacs' own internal shell, um, also great. And I do like that one as well, but I find that having used this one for 10 years, it's pretty much what sticks in my mind the most. Mm -hmm. It's a useful tool, and the fact that I can edit is perhaps the biggest one. 
So you can do things like, let's say, ls, and then you can comment kill. Let's see, what's it called? I'll put to kill ring. I'll put to kill ring. It's normally bound to control x, control o. Yeah. But I rebind it, so if you go into the buffer, you can paste oh. it. Oh. So you can quickly copy output from a command. That's uh, cool. Into your kill ring, yeah, which is very handy. Uh, I had no idea you could do that. I always just end up, you know, control spacing and going all the way back up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's one thing to keep in mind, though, because shell mode is, is literally dumb. What it can't do is it can only guess. So it actually does that by looking at your prompt. So <laughs> if your prompt were to appear anywhere in it, it, it would break the flow of it, basically. But it definitely works. Um, that's very useful. What I like about it is, in general, that IDL mode will use the current directory variable. Yeah. Uh, default, default directory. Uh, default directory to um, sort of seed it. So if you've got deer track mode, let's see, uh, deer track mode enabled, um, mm -hmm. the shell will keep track of the um, of the directory you're in, which obviously it needs to be able to do by looking at, you know, let's see, the tilde character. <laughs> yeah. So if you go into slash temp, it'll track the directory, which is very yeah. useful if you use IDO or whatever a lot. Yeah. So it sort of basically builds it into one. Uh, let's see, what else do I do? Well, one thing that I like a lot that I don't see a lot of people use is just go into Python mode. Uh, <laughs> it seems like you're the kind of person who would benefit from ID Flex and um, SMEX. You know what? I actually tried to get into using that, uh, but... The problem I had with it was, and I haven't tried it in a few years, but a few years ago it had a little bit of a lag starting mm. up, and silly though that may sound, that really put me off. Yeah, yeah. Um, I generally try not to type commands into MX. I save that for very rare one-off commands that I don't do very often, mm -hmm. such as manually setting a mode in a buffer, for instance, yeah. or comment kill output, um, which for most people would be bound to control X, control O. But I have it bound to just remove everything um, instead of just copying it. So one thing I want to talk a little bit about, perhaps, are transposition commands. Yeah. Can so, you uh, increase your text size, sir? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yes, absolutely. There okay. we go. So let's say we're right here. So transposition is basically swapping the characters around the point. Now, one thing that confuses some people is where the point actually is. But it's actually right here. Before, the yeah. Sounds dumb. Before. I know it's a dumb thing to point out, but you know, a lot of people, you know, aren't entirely sure if it's on one or the other side as far as the transposition commands go. But it's you know to the left. So if you do Control T, mm -hmm. it'll transform transposition the characters. Not the most useful one, you might think, but if you're at the end and you do your usual typo or you swap the last two characters. You can just type control T and it'll swap the ones huh. immediately to your left. So I use that all the time. Another one I use all the time is transpose words, yeah. which is bound to meta T. Meta T, that's right. So transpose words uses something called Emacs' syntax table, which is basically a way of listing out all the different characters and what they're supposed to mean in a different mode. So in certain modes, semicolon might be a special character, but in other modes it might not. So in Python, for instance, it is. So if I type MT now... Huh! And it, you kept it within the, uh, the quotes, too. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> actually clever enough to see that quote symbols are quote symbols. The colon is a special but not irrelevant one, so it actually only looks at words. So if you were to do A-B, now that happens to be invalid Python right now, but if I then type MT here, it won't transpose the whole thing. It'll just do the two words because space, or sorry, dash is a, well, it breaks the word basically. Mm -hmm. So what you can also do is control MT, which transposes the entire S expression. And that does it like that by swapping the S expressions around. Not terribly useful here, but if you go back and then do MT, Swap the whole thing. So this is one thing that you could sit down and learn the rules, but I find that just trying to use it over and over again in all kinds of different circumstances mm -hmm. until you sort of mentally map it 
is perhaps you know easier to do. Mm. Um, so you start off with knowing that that there is a better, more emacsy way to do it, and mm. then you're like, okay, what's the key binding for that one again? And you look it up a couple of times, and eventually you just remember. And then you get to the point, perhaps, where you don't even think about, oh, I have used this operation to get my text to what, what I want it to be. I just do this and this and this. Exactly, exactly. One command, so I've talked a little bit about it on the blog before, which is the concept of um, an S expression command. So okay. let me see if I can't zoom in here. So the word S expression, I think, when people go new to Emacs see it, immediately assume that it only deals with, you know, list or at best balanced parentheses. But Emacs is a little bit more clever, or I should say most of the mode developers are a little bit more clever because they enable you to use these commands where you wouldn't otherwise think so. So for instance, let's say I've decided that this dictionary needs to go and I want to have a list instead. So I can type control, let me just write that down, and you or control M up. And it jumps to the top. Mm. So if you then combine it with CMK, control and kill, you kill the entire S expression, which is bound by the two braces. Now, obviously, that's quite handy. But if you're at the end of it, you can just type like that, which is basically negative argument. Like that, negative argument. And then type K. <gasps> I have always ended up doing the backwards X bend. I really should. Look. I should check well, the that. Funny thing is, you know, I use the negative thing all the time because it's surprisingly useful as a way of sort of killing backwards multiple times instead of just moving your point around. So when I see you know really skilled Vim users move around, they're a lot more concerned about sort of you know tailoring movement and delete commands to the exact task by yeah. pounding lines or characters. I almost never do that. I look at purely as, can I kill by balanced expression? Can I kill by word? And obviously, word kill is bound to control backspace. Yeah. So that's nice and easy. Um, <laughs> and forward word kill is bound to MD, obviously, which is also very useful. But one thing that a lot of people find surprising is that going up and down makes it very easy to sort of move around huh. and kill and drag around. So even though Emacs is not known for being a modal editor, provided you understand that these S expression commands exist, you can actually, you know, use them in a surprising amount of places that you wouldn't otherwise think. Mm. And S expressions are the ones I use all the time. Now, there's some really good modes out there now. I haven't had time to sit down and play with them. There's PowerEdit and Lispy and all these other ones out now that do this. What? Well, PowerEdit, Sasha, that's the one for for Emacs Lisp itself. Yeah. But there was that other one that I've smart been... Parent is, is, uh, smart Parent is gradually taking smart over the parent. rest of the, the modes, too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But there's one that sort of adds all these cool slurping features to... Uh, to general purpose modes, which is quite handy. So, but yeah, I use these all the time, and I consider that to be, you know, oh, I, I, I don't know if I could use Emacs again if I didn't have them. They're that mm. important to me. They're really, really, really important commands. So um, what I'm hearing is that when you can get past just thinking of text as characters, and you start working in larger <laughs> syntactic units, right? And you absolutely. end up seeing your program as as a syntax tree, even. You understand it how, how the computer understands it, and that gives you a lot of tools for working around you know, get, getting around and doing things with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's exactly it, you know, and I don't know, I mean, it's just this sort of thing that just, you know, makes Emacs, you know, quite a versatile text editor is that, you know, you know. You <laughs> so how think. many years did it take you to kind of switch to this mindset? <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm pretty good at adopting new things. Uh, provided they're sort of, well, I hesitate to use it was simple, but sort of, you know, not too customizable things. There's a reason why I haven't picked up on a lot of the new things that sort of have come out, which is because I just don't have time to sit down and rewrite all my custom code and <laughs> tie some to the old stuff and all that stuff. So I am perhaps a little bit behind the curve in that sense. But it also means that, you know, I, I think I fully sort of fully mastered, I'd say, a lot of the basic building 
editing and movement commands. So I find that what slows me down is actually thinking more than the writing. Yeah. You know, when I'm not on camera, I can actually write reasonably fast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I find that I type pretty quickly, but I write very slowly, so it's kind of... <laughs> it's yeah, funny I know how that works out. I know what you mean. But, yeah, so, so, you know, I end up spending quite a bit of time on, on these little things, which I find extremely useful. Another one that I find very useful is the mark command, which is... Let's see, I use, normally have visible mark mode. No. Oh, normally, I would have a little program installed that would show me where the marker is, but sadly that one's hidden, so I can't show that. But what I use a lot is the ability to jump around from places I've been before. Oh. So if I like pop am, to mark command, right? Pardon? Uh, pop to mark command? That's right, yeah. So that's control U, space, oh, control space, which sets the mark, yeah. and then control U, control space, which jumps to the last one. Yeah. So, oh, so you might like, um, I found this uh, Emacs list snippet, might even be, have been from you, I can't, I can't remember, but the, uh, when you get control U uh, space, and then you mm -hmm. just keep hitting space to go back to the previous ones. Oh, it's, that's nice, it's yeah. It's a super useful tweak. <laughs> I normally have a, a, a cheese command bound to uh, M and the um, tilde command, mm. but unfortunately Ubuntu, in their infinite wisdom, have decided that this key cannot be rebound from inside the uh, the operating system, and I can't be bothered figuring out how to do it otherwise. So mm -hmm. I had to let that key go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, popping, yeah. But, but popping mark is extremely useful. So I might jump down to the end, you know, yeah. and I can try to control you, control space, to go back to where I was. Yeah. Which, you know, if you're moving around a lot in the buffer, you know, that's extremely useful. Yeah. So let's see, what else do I do that's useful? Uh, Hmm. Ah, let's see. So we covered that. Well, I use Dirad a lot. So let's see. Uh, yeah. So. So I like Dirad. I mean, a lot of people um, don't use it very much. And I recently wrote an article about how to um, get more out of it by using mm -hmm. Find Name Dirad. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can do that. Find Name Dirad. So, does that give me anything useful? Yeah. yeah it does. So, if you go to the command, let's see if I can. So that's uh, find name Dirit. So what that lets you do is it takes a find command, you know, a new find command. Yeah. You give it a starting directory, and then you give it, you know, a standard blobbing pattern, basically, and it will go through and it will get all the files that match whatever your find criteria is. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from constructing a more elaborate yeah. find query with greater than sizes and less than and all that stuff. And it basically lets you mark and mm -hmm. act on all these files in different directories as though it were one big unified Dirit mm -hmm. session. So that will, in many ways, replace um, your standard find XRs. Yeah. Command workflow from the command line. So that's uh, very useful uh, as well. Is find name Dirad compatible with a writable Dirad awesomeness? <laughs> is it is it compatible with what? Sorry? Um you know how Dali Dirad or Control X Control Q will toggle the Dirad uh, the buffer as editable. Does that Yeah. <gasps> that should work. <laughs> I'm happy to renaming things in my SO. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. No, no, no. But but yeah, that should that should work. That should work. So basically <laughs> the mode of operation here is um so Dirid will work with anything that follows this format. Yeah. So it's actually possible to manually write, should you be so inclined, this, or to get the output from the ls command, which has dash d, which I believe is the magic switch, no, dash l, to make the, uh, the Dirid thing come out right like this. And provided the syntax is OK, provided you tell it, which is a virtual Dirid, I think, virtual Dirid. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, so this one. That's cool. So yeah, so basically virtual direct mode is it basically what you want to do if you let's see, start going. Okay. There we go. That's basically what you want. If you if someone's giving you like a 
you know, uh, a text file that's full of LS things and you want to mark by it or search by it or whatever, you can basically go into virtual dirt mode, which assumes that it's not a real dirt buffer. It will instead use your default directory and any absolute or relative path appended to the file name to determine how to go about, you know, um, working on it. Wow. Yeah, again, I mean, no one uses Dirt. I mean, I won't profess to be an expert at it myself, but um, it's worth learning. I mean, it's really worth learning. It's a very useful tool. Uh, and I do use Discover, which I wrote myself. I uh, so, don't know if that, yeah, that won't really show up okay. But it's basically this, which is basically a bit like Maggot, which I'm sure you've used many times, Sasha. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it looks very familiar because yeah. it is basically Maggot's key mode interface. And I've added this, I've created this for Dirit. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, go in, you can get all of the different commands available to you in Dirit. Yeah. And you can just quickly at a glance see what they are, which is very useful for helping you learn how to use Dirit. Yeah, I, I recently set up guide key and like on my configuration because there are some prefixes like you're like, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's great because the discovery, discoverability of Emacs is, is certainly a challenge. You don't even know what's out there. No, exactly. But that's what I like about it is the fact that, you know, you'll bump into someone who may not want to be using Emacs all that long and they'll show you a great trick you've never heard about, you know? And I find that really useful. It's, uh, that's what I like about Emacs is all these little things like being able to combine all these things with Dirit, for instance, you know, which is a really powerful paradigm, you know? So if you're not a master at using find, well, you know, make a slightly wider search criteria and then filter it manually using Emacs' own filtering and search routines and dare it, you know, and boss your uncle. So, yeah. Are there any other particularly interesting snippets in your configuration or workflow, especially your configuration? Because if you're putting off trying, not trying new things because your configuration is so awesome. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I would say that it's more that, um, you know how people, I don't know, there was this chat that I brought a number of years ago who declared Emacs bankruptcy. I think he was the one to use the, the sort of the particular, particular phrase for the first time. Um, let's see, what do I have here? Uh, yeah, that should be something here. So, what I have here is just, well, it's just, it's just a bunch of crap, really. I mean, I'm not disparaging my own work, but mostly just, it's just sort of like a grab bag of random stuff. So, oh, this one's useful. Uh, this one would insert the buffer file name from another buffer. Insert other buffer file name, which when I run it, I'll give it using ah. go a buffer, and it will give me the full file path. Yeah, yeah, I can see how that ends up being quite handy. I Except do use that a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes it might be in, in like, you know, uh, the Python shell or something like that, and I need to feed it, you know, a file name to some function that I already have open, and instead of, you know, typing it out, I just do it like this. So that's primarily what it's for. I also have this. This, I think this is actually the first, ah, oh yes, Rx Builder. So what I've done with that one is I've actually changed it so it uses Rx by default. The, uh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Builder interface. So actually, a lot of people don't know this. So Rx Builder obviously lets you build, you know, um, let's see, any, what is it? Let's see. Let's see, oh, I can never bloody remember. I know, I end up just writing regular, regular, regular expressions. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do normally do that, so I have a custom one bound to, um, to that. So, I use Rx Builder if I'm building for modes, ah. like doing fairly complicated things, I'll tend to use that, but I always have to keep the manual open because I can never really remember the syntax. But a lot of people don't know that Rx Builder or RE Builder, you can actually change the syntax mode of users, which is quite handy. Uh, it's not know. just stuck using the built-in default one. Um, I have a fix XML and an equivalent yeah. uh, fix JSON, fix this, fix that, which calls, you know, out to like a tidy tool to clean up, you know, mm -hmm. the code. Quite useful if I'm getting, you know, one big line dump. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, oh, this... actually, I want to go back to that RE Builder in case uh, people aren't familiar yeah. with that, because you have people who, who haven't tried it, maybe. So RE Builder lets you interactively build regular expressions, and you can see what it matches and what it doesn't match in your buffer right away. So 
super handy if you're uh, if you're trying to match some things but not others. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. Um, it doesn't work very well in large buffers. It will eventually sort of sort of stop placing overlays, but it's a very useful tool. The one problem I have with it is I always forget what a quit command is. So I always do control F control Q, which says it's a read only, but it really should be control C control Q, which quits. <laughs> Although there is a useful command in there. Let's see, something that copies the regular expression. Let's see, C B I think. Uh, oh C B says a target buffer. C W. Yeah. So if you type control C, control W, yeah. paste. But it will paste a uh, list friendly version of yeah. which is quite handy if you're doing that a lot. Yeah. So that's useful. Yeah, I always end up counting slashes, so that's really yeah. great. Yeah. But that's the thing. So by default you can actually have it print out double slashes so you don't have to do that yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is quite useful. Um, what else yeah. do I have? Um, tidy, 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 so match path, split my string. So this is what I'm using now, which is which is why I'm so adamant about not wanting to change too much. I'm actually using the old skeleton mode before smart parents and all that came around, which is the the way that yeah, you know you go about inserting balance. Oh, yeah. well, it doesn't actually work, but <laughs> going about inserting balance, mm -hmm. um, balance parentheses and all that. I am very so, sweet for getting the hang of smart parents. It, it, it's awesome. I just I, I'm not good enough to. Thinking it yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had that problem with Power Edit as well. You know, it's 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 really hard to memorize all these these different ones. Um, mm -hmm. So what is that? Oh, that doesn't look too relevant to anyone. Oh yes, Pill Ring Save. So this is a good ah. one. So normally, Control W requires that you have something you know marked before it works. This one, if you just have Control W with you know nothing marked, it just kills the entire line. Yeah. yeah. Now. It is also bound to control shift backspace. But <laughs> I find control W easier because well it well it just works fine. I mean yeah. it still works if things are selected. Yeah. But actually I almost never do this, you know. If I want to kill something, I kill it mm. by writing by S expression, you know? Yeah. So that's very good. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, go to simple. Yeah, so I got this from Emacs Wiki many years ago. It basically makes um, iMenu use IDO instead, which is quite handy. Um, that makes sense. What else do I have? Oh, well, I've got this, which is like a custom font locking for, um, for Python mode. So if I type. Oh, so if you have any to do's and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it'll yeah, just yeah. highlight in red, which I find quite useful. Um, yeah. um, what else do I have? Uh, um, Tuckling. Yeah, I write lots of stuff once, then I use it for a while, then I don't need it anymore, and I just leave it in, which is why it's <laughs> an absolute nightmare. Well, you know how it is. Yeah, well, you know yeah, it. Yeah, it keeps yeah. adding up and adding up and adding up. Yeah, um, um, I found that organizing my config into rough sections helped me a lot because then at least when I was going to my config to write or save the functions that I just put together, I could mm -hmm. at least realize that I had already written the exact same function. <laughs> well, that's the problem I have. I do actually have many files with all kinds of stuff in there, but I find that I don't know, after 10 years, I've, I've never actually deleted my entire thing and started over since I started using Emacs. So there's a lot of you know, stuff in there, basically, <laughs> that you, know, you never really seem to get rid of. And because I'm a self-employed contractor, I'll work in very varying, varying uh, companies. So in one of them, I'll be using Oracle all the time, so I can get things set up for Oracle. Other times, I just use Postgres. Yeah, you know, you really don't know. So you end up with a lot of stuff that you keep around in case you might need it again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what else do I have that's okay. interesting? Well, I've got Smart Scan, which is, um, let's see. So basically, as you move around with point, let's see. Uh, if I hold down uh, meta P and N, yeah. it will take the word that point is on and go between them. Mm. So I find without any sort of prompt, nothing like that, it's great if you're, you know, you're browsing around in code and you go, oh, interactive, where's that variable or whatever declared yeah, yeah. Let's have a look around and see where it is. Oh, well, there's some stuff here, yeah. you know. So that's what I use it for. So yeah. that's really good. That's really good. I use that all the time, all day, every day. Um, 
<laughs> so I'm getting the sense that your your uh, config accretes as you come up with little ideas for things that you could do more efficiently or ways that you could tweak things. And then it just keeps on growing. Sometimes you remember what's in there, sometimes not. But you know, if you ever if you ever run out of blog post ideas, I'm sure you can just go through your config and fix the best. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But it is a big problem, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, yeah, but I think I, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I think that sort of covers sort of the things that I haven't yet talked about on the blog anyway in terms of things, you know, particularly the transposition. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been waiting for, uh, I've been sort of writing a little bit about that subject privately that I'm planning on yeah. publishing at some point because I don't think people are really using transposition enough, which I think is a real shame. So, yeah. I don't remember, um, and I really should have checked beforehand. Is your config posted on the web anywhere? No, nope, it's not posted <gasps> anywhere. Mostly because there's some personal stuff in there uh, that's just that I need to clean out. But then I need to make sure that what I keep online and what I keep privately are still kept separately. Oh, so, the way that I, just, I handle it is I just have an Emacs Secrets L file that I load. Uh, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like that idea, actually. I've been thinking about doing something like that, but the problem I have is, you know, if I go to, like, this one, so I actually have a whole bunch of crap that sort of ties in to my Emacs. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll go to a new computer because they work all over the place, and I'll type a few commands, and it'll sort of bootstrap bash, it'll set up, things will download and install various stuff, you know, so all this is fairly automated in a very rudimentary yeah. way. I've been meaning to move it all to salt or something, but it just, I don't really get it around to it because, well, it's just time consuming, yeah. so. It's kind of funny, people tend to think, oh, it's, it's just a config, how, how will other people make sense of it? You don't see the workflow, but really, actually, when you read through other people's config, you're like, oh, I never knew that function existed or this thing could be configured that way like uh, re builder it actually does have a way that you can set your your default syntax so it's it, it, it's always fun looking through other people's config <laughs> absolutely but that's the thing i want to clean mine up so it's actually useful because if you just dumped it out there people would be like you know it's, it's fairly uncommon to you know there's no explanation about what a lot of the stuff does so i'll have to clean it up first because you know i I want to make sure people get a good impression of it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me show you one thing that I don't think a lot of people have done before, which uh, is really quite cool. Yeah. Um, I went to Wikipedia a long time ago, and I found a list of the most commonly misspelled or mistyped words. Mm -hmm. And I decided to build an abbreviation, a global abbreviation table of them that replaces the misspelled one with the correct one. So let me yeah. scroll down here. Oh, that's not actually, uh, where is it? Uh, where are they? Yeah, it seems to have gone missing. <laughs> Clearly you've been typing well anyway. Yeah, I was just looking around where I put the file, but it seems I've misplaced it. Oh, well, that's a shame. That's okay, it's a good that. idea. I have uh, something similar working with auto hotkey, so when I mistype something, it just automatically corrects it. But it's it should yeah, be able to change that. But it's, it's actually really great because, you know, because it's a brief, you know, it just replaces it without telling me, so I don't even notice it. So it, it's very sort of silent and quiet. It just works, unlike the spelling system, which is also great, you know, it doesn't require inter any interaction from me. It just works in the background. Yeah. So I find that extremely useful. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, functions that silently make you smarter, or at least... <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Oh, it even does the, the accents and all that. So, wow. uh, yeah, I know, it's great. <laughs> it's a little bit annoying if you're using the word resume in like a coding yeah, yeah, yeah. and it replaces it with resume, which... <laughs> you can always take that one out of your, your dictionary. I know, know but to be surprised how often I find myself not catching that when I'm writing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I used, to, I used to always switch to the the input method for say Latin one prefix, and then I found out that you can just use Control X eight, and then uh, and, and and you can use that to add um, add accents to the characters. Oh yeah, that's really great. Uh, I really like Control X eight. Uh, <laughs> it's a great one actually because you can type in Unicode snowman and all these fun <laughs> simple kind of things. So it's really good fun. It's really good fun. Uh, and Emacs has great Unicode support, you know, it has yeah. really good Unicode support. And that's one thing I actually really appreciate, because sometimes you don't get to work in UDF, UTF-8 if you're getting yeah. files from Thailand or something like that. So you need to be able to work with them, you know, have it saved and render correctly. So that's really mm -hmm. useful. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm getting kind of 
from this entire conversation is that the road to mastering Emacs is basically use it all the time. Think about how you're using it and when you're doing things that are inefficient or there are probably more Emacsy ways to do things. On occasion, just read through stuff to be inspired by things that you didn't even know that you were doing inefficiently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, th I think, you know, just sort of keeping your eyes and ears open, Emacs Wiki is a great resource now as well. Uh, so I highly recommend that everyone who, who doesn't use it, use it, because you learn a lot of just sort of random snippets, but, you know, you can sort of take them, play around with them, and see if you can find a way to work it into your lifestyle. I really like the way that uh, the Emacs Wiki has that random page link. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that. That's okay, pretty cool. now you know. Um, if you, uh, also, if you hit it too often, because I end up like going through all the uh, <laughs> like 10 or so random pages, I think if you, if you try to read too much of the Emacs Wiki too quickly, it, it tells you to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> There. But you're just, being, you're just being a good student. I mean, you yeah. know, you should be punished for that. <laughs> the other thing I was considering, actually, in terms of Emacs Wiki being a great resource, so you can actually check it out as a Git repository. Really? <laughs> and, yeah, oh. yeah. And so oh. you can systematically just read through everything. It is very large. I also recommend, there was like one good page that I found very useful when I was sort of, sort of still learning Emacs. Well, I'm still learning Emacs, but when I started out anyway, was the... Um, Random tips and tricks page. Random okay. tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's just it's just one liners, you know, but there's some really fun ones in there and sort of well, they just make you think. You may not find it useful, but at least you know it's there. So when if you do need it or you do want to learn how to do it, you know where you can find it, which I find really useful. But I think the problem slash with Emacs in general, I mean I think I'm just gonna switch back to my camera here. Let me just let me see. Go ahead. There. There we go. I think the problem with it is inevitably that you end up in a situation where you've exhausted all your resources, you know, I mean, in terms of learning Emacs, you know, and I think learning Emacs is perhaps too hard, not that people shouldn't do it, but that it is too hard in some ways, because there's a, there isn't really a lot of great information that takes you from like the very beginnings. I wrote my very first article was, you know, like getting started with Emacs. But looking back at it, you know, through 45 years of, of writing blog entries, I realize now that actually I don't think it's as useful as I thought it was back then, if, you, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I've been, uh, so that's, when I started the, the blog a few years ago, I got approached by a couple of publishers to, to write a book, basically. At the time, I didn't have time. But over the past year or so, I've sort of slowly been working towards writing a book uh, on Emacs, yeah. So, uh, that's part of the reason why I haven't been as active on the blog as well. Uh, the blog will remain free and I'll keep posting on it, but I figured it would be easier for me to do sort of bigger, longer expositions into how things work. And, you know, unlike my blog, get it professionally copy edited as well, which, you know, <laughs> say what you want, but that's still a nice thing, you know. <laughs> you can hire editors, so there's no, exactly. you know. Well, exactly, but I think there's a real demand for that. Yeah, yeah, there I've is. I've been working on this for about a year and a half, on and off a little bit. I mean, uh, but the real problem I've had is actually Deciding the topics, you know, should it be straight for beginners? Should it be something that targets a little bit more intermediate? I don't know. I mean, I'm quite keen to hear what people think, actually. Well, well. from what I hear, there's, there's a real pent-up demand, not just for the same beginner's guides that we're seeing, but, but really, how do you take it to the next step, and how do you get that linchpin moment, that, aha, this is how yeah. Emacs really works, this is how I can use it for whatever workflows that I can imagine. And yeah. something like that that does focus on mastering Emacs, that, you know, that, that helps people feel confident in combining different parts of it or even inventing their own tools, I think that would be very much welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't know. I mean, you've done a lot of work on that in org mode as well. Yeah. You know, you actually go and draw cheat sheets, which is, <laughs> I, I've been so, thus far, I've been too, too lazy to attempt that. But do you find that people, I mean, I used a cheat sheet that I created myself, just an Excel yeah. spreadsheet, just for commands. But I mean, my, lots of people must have come up to you and said, "Hey, that's really helped me learn org mode." But what has made your org mode sort of what made your org mode skills that good? Yeah. Was it perseverance? Uh, I think it's it's also just looking at other people's workflows and saying, "Hey, that's really cool." And I think that the challenge here mainly is, is that there are so many workflows and so are, there are so many things that no one book and no one website can cover all the different things that people can know or, or even need to know. 
Um, but I, I guess what I like about, say, the reading guide that you have on your site, or the, the other things that you can, you can slowly start putting together, is that people are, are giving people a map. Because when you're a beginner, you have no idea what, what sequence to learn things in and what makes sense to combine. But really, when somebody says, Okay, if you if you're interested in, in, interested in this, you can learn this and this and this, and that makes it more manageable and less intimidating. And then when you when you've learned those three things, this fourth thing actually becomes really easy yeah. to do. Well, exactly. That's how I found it as well. I, but I think that there's a there's like a big schism in the Emacs community between the sort of the very old timers, you know, who. You know, you know, we're not writing the editor for anyone except ourselves, which is a valid point. You know, I'm, I'm not dis disputing that, but I don't know. That, that there's a reason why a lot of people pick up editors like Sublime Text and so on. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, I was actually working with a uh, with a guy a few months ago who was who was really skilled at Sublime Text. We spent ages customizing it as well. I'm like thinking, damn, I thought these things were just plug and play. No, but you know. So, so it just goes to show that there are people yeah. out there willing to tinker with their editors, and Emacs is a tinkerer's editor. So I wonder what would it take to capture these people's, you know, imaginations and make them mm. consider the fairly steep learning curve to start out with. Yeah. You know, that's what. I, I like the way that screencasts and blog posts of people writing not just about features but how they're using those features. Those kind of inspire people to say, okay, you know what? It, it, getting there, you know, requires learning new keyboard shortcuts and you know, learning a little bit of Emacs list and all these parentheses, but it's worth it because they can see how it's worth it to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I've sort of switched to a more workflow oriented blog posting style mm -hmm. as well, where I at least try and work in a few examples of how I use it. Because I think people get more out of that than just, you know, sort of one long, <laughs> one long rant by me about some topic. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see that, and also interesting to see how you flow through the different topics in a book. Um, I, I was working on a, on a wicked, wicked cool Emacs sort of collection of, of snippets, too, but I found the challenge was that every time I posted about something, people thought, oh, that's a great idea, let me change the, the, the you know, let me change the, the source code to make it even easier to configure so you don't need like three lines, you don't need like 30 lines of code, you just need like one configuration variable. And so writing for a moving target can be an interesting challenge. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. The problem is people want my theme for some reason, you know, the color scheme you saw. And it's never been a theme it, it, <laughs> because it was made way back in the day before themes existed. But I get people asking me for it. I'm like, I, I'll get around to releasing it. It's just that if I release it, I have to maintain it as well because they wanted the packaging and then I have to version it and I have to put it in the right place. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's all these little things, you know, but they just take up time, you know, but it's a yeah. good thing. But I think the Emacs community has really, really changed in the last few years, starting with the package managers and GitHub and all these things. Yeah. And I think Emacs is a, it's always been a friendly community, but it's an easier community to get into, I think, now than I it was. I think so now. I mean, with meetups and, you know, and, and yeah. YouTube screencasts. And all these other <laughs> wonderful ways. Exactly. More, yeah. more ways for the community to get to, uh, to bond with one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being part of that community and contributing so much to it. Thanks a lot, Sasha. You too. Absolutely. Okay. I'll see you around. And um, everyone listening to Emacs Chat, thanks for coming too. Bye. Thank you.